Welcome to A Little Too Quiet. This is the Ferndale Library Podcast, brought to you by the friends of the Ferndale Library. We're here in Ferndale, Michigan, a mile north of Detroit. And today we're going to be talking about youth services. We've got a librarian in the house. Elissa Zimmer is here. And we're going to be talking about, well, everything that comes with that, especially the need to be craftier and craftier when you're in this position. And uh, I think just the the art of itself of putting on a good story time. We're going to get into that. We're also going to get into where Elissa grew up, which was Kalamazoo. Kalamazoo has a really cool library. Can we just can we just start? You hear you're here in Ferndale. You came to us from almost the other side of the state. I'm just eager to hear about whether or not you went to that awesome Kalamazoo library and which branch you went to. Did you go to the Central Branch? Did you go to the Ashtimo Branch? Am I saying Ashtimo. that right? Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so I actually grew up going to two branches. I grew up closest to the Ostromo branch, Mm -hmm. and then I also went to the Central Library when I was growing up, and I can't even remember my first library visit. I was one of those kids who had, Jeff Milo does this now, yes, but huge stacks of books balanced under my chin, was semi-challenged by the (laughs) Cirque staff, can you read everything? And I said, oh yeah, no problem. Oh, that's awesome! I was gonna ask if you were that that kind of I was uh, that kid that kind of kid because I think that uh, the stereotypical image of someone who becomes a librarian is someone who is in the library a lot in their youth, loving to read. You but, know. Yeah, but I didn't know I wanted to be a librarian. That was a but surprise to me. You didn't know, <laughs> and here you are. You are a uh, youth librarian. We've been talking to adult librarians. We've had someone coming in here talking about book clubs and readers' advisory. We had our head of adult services talking about film collection, but now we're talking to Elissa about dealing with the kids and what that's like. You told us in a in another podcast episode that you actually weren't expecting to become a youth librarian. How did you get on this road? I don't even know. <laughs> um, what road were you on before? I guess when I first started out, I wanted to be a teen librarian just because that was the the most instrumental time for me in, in my life in using the library, and I kind of wanted to give that back. But as I went to library school and really started my career, I realized that more and more that's kind of a niche thing, and I wanted to do I wanted to do more of a variety. Mm-hmm. And when you're in library school, it's not like you can get on the track. It's not, this is the youth services librarian track. Or or do they have that? Yeah. All right. I actually got a graduate certificate in public library services to children and young adults. Great. Great. Mm -hmm. And it's good to demonstrate how ignorant my question was was there just there. Because if anyone's (laughs) listening to this podcast and they're like 10 episodes in, they should know by now that I'm not a librarian. So I'm as ignorant as all of you, but we're learning as we go. So there was a track. So my first real professional job was in a small library, so I literally did programming for babies through adults. Um, I took over for someone who had worked in the library for 30 years and basically only focused on kids, and they didn't really have much in the way of programming at all, so I was able to grow all of it from the ground up. And I think just from that experience, I realized how fun kids are, how dynamic that job could be. I think what first in library school kind of kept me from wanting to be that is I think that the public sometimes sees us as babysitters in a way like that doesn't always happen but I think you know we're obviously trained to work with children it feels like a safe space but I think it's important to note that the library still is a public space so yeah I was doing some google searching about youth librarians and the word babysitting came up Mm -hmm. uh used in a a, used basically as a concern of not wanting to fall into that or be seen as that Mm -hmm. but running the risk of being that i think my view of youth librarianship has moved more towards being a role model and being kind of a conduit into literacy right on realizing how important that is and again the dynamism of this position you never know what you're gonna get that is such an excellent answer to give what are you now um how long out of library school how many years? Mm, four years. Okay. Four or five years. I can't even remember. <laughs> the quote you just dropped on us sounded so so noble. Oh, you, thank did you. you. Did you have that in your in your brain when you took over day one? Were you intimidated on day one? Were you inspired and 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 just ready to change the world from day one? What did? How did you feel on day one? Oh God, 
I don't know. I feel like the early part of my career was just, it was such a steep learning curve. Like I was definitely super excited about taking it on. And when I took over at my first library, there was one story time. And then I did a story time in the park and someone was trying to bring their nine month old baby. And she said that she didn't want to drive 20 minutes for the nearest baby story time. And I was like, well, I guess I'll be putting that on in the fall. Let me learn how to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's been really fun to learn and and change as I've gone along. And, all right, so what have been some of the things that you found really rewarding or fulfilling about this? I mean, I think I talked in my previous episode about having teenagers come to me for advice. That's been really rewarding. Yeah. But I think, you know, more towards the younger kids, it's been really awesome to have the regulars and to really develop these relationships with families Mm -hmm. as they come in and to be super excited to see the growth in the different children. So, you know, zero to five, like there's so much going on, even zero to six months, six to 12 months, like kids are just growing like crazy, getting smarter. All those neural pathways are forming. Right. It's great to watch the kids grow. Right, right. And I guess let's also talk about how youth librarians are expected to do so much. Oh yeah. So much more than maybe in the 80s or 70s when there was just like just story times, Mm -hmm. you know? It's funny that you bring that up because we actually had our youth services roundtable committee through the library network, which is the cooperative we're part of. So the featured speaker was someone from Wisconsin who was talking about apps and story time. And there's been a big move, I believe in School Library Journal, there have been some articles lately about digital literacy and I know Jeff you and another librarian are doing one geared towards adults right mm-hmm. but there there's like a whole movement about it in story time so how are you building literacy with your child so you know obviously like people have a lot of cell phones they have tablets and stuff like that so how are you using those for good yeah right and using them in a developmentally appropriate way so we learned about a few different apps in story time we learned about how to use them how to make those transitions is it like a matter of just increasing the interactivity are you i'm I'm picturing you with an ipad doing a story time i'm pantomiming right now yeah so i think the the thing that people kind of fall back on doing is just parking their kid in front of some technology and thinking the technology is going to teach them but really using apps as an interactive way and asking questions and engaging with them. So saying, uh, oh, should I choose this thing or that thing? And having the kid help make that decision and then seeing what happens once they've made their choice. We learned about some really cool apps um, that help build words and help with spelling and stuff like that. And then there's a visual component, obviously, that kind of backs up the, the words and the letters. So that was really cool. And that's just engaging them. It's rather than Mm -hmm. being passive and watching Peppa Pig. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. It is a little overwhelming, I think. So, you know, going back to your point about, like, we're expected to know all these things. So, you know, luckily we haven't had as many reference questions about apps here. But we do um, have the awe computer. So they have games for ages 0 to 8 about. Um, So parents do sit with their kids and play with those here in Ferndale Library. That's pretty cool. Mm Mm-hmm. What about the craftiness? Oh boy, you know. crafts. Okay, so here's the thing about youth librarianship is you usually in- inherit a giant craft closet or room. Construction paper, glitter, crayons, Everything. glue, all the stuff. So, you know, you inherit these items and you have to think, what can I use so that this place is not utterly overwhelming? And so that's kind of a big thing for me is looking at what I already have and seeing, you know, I don't really want to spend a ton of money and Mm -hmm. what can I use? And additionally, I also, I'm a little bit of a hoarder. So. <laughs> it's okay, Kelly, she already admitted. I called myself the library pack rat yesterday because yeah. I, I still had a map of our temporary location stored on my hard drive. Something wow. from 10 years ago that we'll never need again. Yeah, exactly. So, but we did need it for the podcast. <laughs> so my example, um, I started back here full time in summer of 2018 and I feel like just a few months in, I had a patron call and say that she had two garbage bags full of shoe boxes and she thought of the library like, hey, can you use these for crafts before I just recycle them or get rid of them? And I said, okay, sure. <laughs> Nothing in mind at all. So those two garbage bags full of shoe boxes stayed above my desk for over a year. 
and they were actually just used in our shoebox foosball program that was put on by another youth librarian. Terrific. You know, I walked through your office quite often and would my eye would see in the periphery a garbage bag and I would always wonder. What was in the- <laughs> <laughs> um, And I'm actually going to be using the rest of them. We're doing a steam shop for kindergarten through second grade. I'm going to cut them up and use the lids and the containers for marble mazes. So it paid off. Which is a whole other thing that builds into how mm, pressuring this position can be because you can't only think of programs that are going to entertain the kids. You have to enrich and uh, expand their mind. Mm -hmm. And so STEAM is, what is STEAM? That's an acronym. Yep, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. And so that's a program that the head of youth services and I developed and we found that we weren't really hitting the like five to seven or eight year old thing. So we wanted to really offer something to them. And so it's a really fun way of doing a hands-on activity and we're encouraging parent or caregiver interaction with this program because a lot of times we're using like hot glue and scissors right. and all that sort of thing. Right. So not only are the kids learning, but they're doing something fun and educational with their grown up. Yeah, that's such a hands-on age. Mm-hmm. That's like the age I would always love to go to the Science Museum or Cranbrook and just see weird stuff and yeah, mess with it. It's a lot, but mm-hmm. it's very rewarding yeah. and they get a lot out of it, so that's fun. Yeah, hopefully there are some future engineers and mathematicians mm-hmm. who start here in the library. I also wanted to say, I think it's really important, kind of kitty corner adjacent to that is the idea of art. So I've been really into the idea of process art. Mm -hmm. So that's been a big wave in youth services is not offering a craft and saying, these are the pieces, this is exactly the way that you make this thing. Step one, two, three. Exactly, getting away from that. So in my last steam shop, I did stamping and printing. Mm -hmm. So we used clothespins and made different brush heads. So we had pom-pom balls, leaves, ribbon, and pipe cleaners. And so the kids could dip those in acrylic paint and just paint something. And then I cut citrus fruit in half and used those to print and stamp. And then the assistant director made me some really rad potato stamps. So she carved some shapes out of a half of a potato and we used those. Which was Um, incredible. She just another day in the library the assistant director is in the break room whittling potatoes Mm -hmm. and i also think of it seasonally too so um in my previous job i did watercolors with ice cubes so i put some a little bit of paint in an ice cube tray with some water and then we went outside and basically used the summer heat to melt those and they made watercolors on some paper oh that's pretty cool Yeah, so that's got to be a whole other part of your job is consistent returning to brainstorming for what's the next cool thing I can do. And I'd say that comes and goes in waves. Sometimes I'm feeling super inspired and I'm like, idea, idea, idea. And then there's sometimes where it's just not happening at work. And usually those days I go home and when I'm trying to fall asleep, I'm like, program idea. (laughs) Do you have some favorite programs overall or some favorite memories? Um, I especially want to get into some of the stuff you've done with teens where you where you lock them in the library. But, oh, okay, but tell yeah, me. we'll get to that. We'll get to that. So, again, Hoarder. Uh-huh. Um, one of the favorite things that I did, and I'm really into the idea of staying green, so I used to be a very religious takeout coffee drinker, so I had a ton of coffee sleeves, and I just, I know you can recycle them, but I was like, oh, what can I do with these? So I ended up doing a program where I turned them into planters so there's a way that you can kind of fold them together and then once you have a seedling you can literally just put them in the ground and then the cardboard will disintegrate eventually so that was pretty cool and as that is I, eco-friendly and adorable yeah, yeah. it's just and messy del- and messy <laughs> and delightful and as i said before i used to do programming for all ages so i used to do a third thursday craft night in my previous position so much fun and that one was specifically for adults because i feel like we need to cultivate some creativity in adults still we get it whipped out of us over time so um i did a bad art night nice and again that's a great way of using everything in your craft closet get rid of some of that sort of thing that is a whole thing though we interviewed an author on here who runs an immersive theater company and she was like when adults grow up they're not allowed to play anymore Mm -hmm. or they don't allow themselves to play anymore Mm -hmm. and that you know bring it full circle that's the beauty of being a youth services librarian not saying (laughs) we aren't grown up but we get to kind of stay in that childhood innocence and just we get to be silly yeah for sure so much fun even if a a six-year-old's coming up to your desk for a reference question you you just you have to 
talking to them is really interesting, right? Because you, mm-hmm. you're obviously you don't want to talk to them like you're kind of sending them, but you want to talk to them on their level. But you want to it's such mm-hmm. a it's such a it's a magic trick you guys do that I would never be able to do. I think I've gotten to the point where it's easier to talk to kids sometimes than it is to <laughs> talk to grownups. I just think of you know our staff doing the uprooted program, which is a music and movement program, and you peek in there and you know, whichever librarian is leading it is jumping up and down and singing. And it's delightful to see you guys move That's around That's a whole like other thing is to, 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 turn, to, to turn on that sort of performance thing. Because it, if I were dancing around and, and throwing scarves and whatever else and handing out shaker eggs and whatever, uh, I would feel a little self-conscious. But you, you do yeah. at times. But it's like, can you even get embarrassed in front of kids? Because they're just, they're just having fun. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. I think, you know, going back to when I first started too, baby story time was always my favorite because babies don't judge you. Sometimes <laughs> toddlers say minutely judgy things. <laughs> toddlers have no filter, so well, they'll sure. be very honest sure. with you. Sure. But th- it's all fun. Yeah. It's all fun. Yeah. Yeah, more about... Just the did you did you realize what you were going back to library school? Did you realize what you were getting into? No. At that point, <laughs> were there things about let's say your Elissa back in library school? Where'd you go to school? I went to Wayne State for my master's in library science. Okay, cool. All right, you're in the thick of it. Mm-hmm. And is there is there something about the future you imagine in your head? Is there something like there? Is there's an aspect about being a librarian that is really pulling you. Setting aside the stuff that you never expected you'd be doing, is there is there one sort of primary principle about it that that you knew you wanted to, to pursue? I may be repeating myself, but I think it's this sense of giving back. So mm-hmm. I had such a wonderful experience with libraries and library programs when I was growing up, and so offering that space to someone else. Yeah. Um, so you knew what you were getting into. Yeah, I did. Okay. <laughs> I did. Kind of. Whether or not you knew you'd be having garbage bags or shoeboxes or not, you mm-hmm. know, you were ready to put on those programs. Mm-hmm. Uh, any other favorite memories, favorite things you've, you've done? We didn't even get into the lock-ins. Now, she doesn't literally lock teens in. Unless we're doing escape room. Oh, yeah, there's whole there's that. Yeah. Do we want to talk about yeah, lock-ins? Yeah, let's talk about the lock-ins. Okay, like, so... You had them bowling? Well, t- oh, tell yeah. us the story. So we did a teen Halloween. So we do after-hours programs for teens in grades 6 through 12, it's really special for them because they love being in the library and kind of having free run when no one else does. That's really cool for them. So we did Teen Halloween about a week before Halloween last year, and we did pumpkin bowling. So we had some plastic water bottles, like semi-full of water, and we had pie pumpkins. So they were rolling those and trying to knock over these water bottles, and they got into it. <laughs> We were bowling from one short end of our community room to the other, and they were bowling really hard, so the pie pumpkin started to crack, and then I think eventually it just died. But it can it, it's so tricky to, not even to divert away from more of your favorite memories, but it can be so tricky to, at least I imagine it's tricky to reach teens, or to just allow them to feel like they are, you know... Valued? Yeah, mm-hmm. I guess that's it, right? Because they'll, I don't know, it's hard to engage them, I guess. I think it goes back to what you were saying about talking to each kid at their level. So, yeah, teens like sarcasm. And there's that. Um, I'm real good at that with them. <laughs> they, I don't, yeah, like they don't. I don't always present myself as I am the adult authority. Blah blah blah. Like that's implicit in the relationship. But I'm, I'm engaging them about books. I'm engaging them about their interests, like all that sort of thing. So. Yeah, I think it's taking an active interest in their lives and what's going on because there's so much of the world. And even within libraries, teens are one of the least valued populations. Mm -hmm. They're often overlooked. You know, they're considered a problem or a nuisance by other patrons at times, depending on behavior issues and all that sort of thing. But really showing them that they're worth something and, again, giving them a voice is really important. I ran a teen book club here like yeah. before we had enough staff what? to do I it. I didn't yeah. know that. I didn't know this. It was Darlene and I together. And uh, one of the things I learned from you know engaging them, I let them pick the books. And mm-hmm. one of them picked one that was pretty controversial, had some like intense sex scenes in it. And I, you know, I went back and forth about, oh, you know, what are we going to do about it? And I decided to just not be shocked. Mm-hmm. 
because you know what like whatever and i think they expected us to like get flabbergasted about it and fumble and we didn't and i think that once the giggles and stuff sort of worn down we just talked about the book and we talked about that scene and you know why it was important why it was in there and you know i wouldn't say oh they respected me after that but i feel like a couple of them were like oh we can kind of explore this stuff and you know you're not going to just bowl me over with a feather mm, you know yeah yeah there's definitely getting at that being real with them and not sugarcoating stuff not protecting them and i feel like that's really important nowadays too because there's so much like graphic content out in the world and that they can access yeah at a younger and younger age and so i think you know going back to digital literacy and that sort of thing it's moderating that in a way that's healthy yeah we're providing books and resources for them right man that's a whole other thing it's just worrying about what they're looking at at the internet i feel sound like i'm one of their parents but you, Jeff, do a you know media literacy stuff. It's less about yeah. Don't let them look at it, and more about teaching them how mm-hmm. to evaluate what they're seeing and exactly. what they're reading. You exactly. know, I mean, I can probably everyone at this table read or watched or listened to something quote unquote too soon, and how you like process it is like, you know, how you learn to grow, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, first Daniel Steele novel at age ten. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Because it was laying around. Oh, my. Oh, yeah. Plenty of my friends read Stephen King when they were like eight or nine Mm. and got scared or whatever. I read all of the Anne Rice Vampire Chronicles like as a preteen. And, you know, my mom saw that I was reading a book. I don't think she cared what it was, but there was some stuff in there that I didn't know how to process. Mm -hmm. I guess you're right. I turned out fairly well adjusted considering I saw Nightmare on Elm Street at age six and Pulp Fiction at 11. (laughs) Well, (laughs) yeah. We're hanging in there. But you think about, you know, if you had somebody to talk to at the library about it who didn't act, oh, I can't believe you're reading that. You're not allowed to read that. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's another thing we want to encourage, too, right? If there's any teen or youth or kid out there who might not feel comfortable coming to their teacher, maybe they can come to their librarian. And I think that's what it's really important about developing these personal relationships with patrons, especially if they come in regularly, because you not only get to learn you know, their reading habits and interests and stuff like that, but you also can see what's their maturity level if they come in with their parents, you know, what are their parents saying they should and shouldn't be reading and kind of gauging that. Yeah. And then I just, as a compliment to you and your youth squad, I felt like a little bit of pride when I went out to a bar once and I was like, yeah, our library has an escape room. Talk about that. (laughs) No, the Harry Potter one was a particular hit. Whoa, it was crazy. Talk about the smiles on the family's faces coming out of that escape room. Mm -hmm. We had people coming from as far as northern Macomb County for that one. And I remember we had like over a thousand people interested on Facebook and everything got filled up within basically the first 24 hours of registration opening. We should say that libraries with, with crazier, bigger funding they would hire that stuff out but you guys did it all in-house which Mm -hmm. is also commendable man and that was a partnership between youth services and adult services which is you know really great to be part of a team because everybody has different strengths so there i am we're talking about crafts right i am not inherently a crafty person you lie Um, (laughs) in comparison to two other people on staff we had them make mandrakes out of just craft clay Mm -hmm. i would never be able to do that Mm -hmm. and they were just like we got this Mm -hmm. so you know it's really great to be part of a team where everyone again has their role and we can just say okay i'm not good at x but you are yeah take it away yeah that's one of my favorite parts about the library so can you also talk about you didn't possibly also anticipate because we didn't get into this last time you didn't anticipate that you were going to be in a library that was partnered with a school district that there's got to be some other benefits to that that we might not have covered in terms of your ability to actually connect with with kids yeah and i think it's something that we're still kind of feeling out that relationship so it's growing as we speak you know we're really taking advantage of the fact that we have kids going to the school and so we can just tap into a teacher's classroom and if they have a great relationship with their teacher or if their teacher is really good at getting the word out, there's our program promotion right mm-hmm. there. And I think that's why the Teen Halloween was so successful because we had 
one middle school teacher who was um, promoting it very heavily. And so the day of, we had like five to seven last minute signups of mm-hmm. people who were like, oh, this is happening. I didn't know. Let's go. That's kind of my goal. We're doing an on Valentine's Day lock in. Tell me all about it. Because love sucks. Oh my gosh. Um, so that idea inherently comes out of, you know, the sappiness and promotion of love. Right. I roll. Right. For Valentine's Day. And I guess the emphasis is not on um, needing a partner or needing to have romantic love in your life and just finding that elsewhere and within yourself. So it's kind of an anti-Valentine's Day friendship celebration, self-celebration. We're going to have a chocolate fountain. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. We're going to dip lots of things in the chocolate fountain. Not not even just to get into like child psychology, but that is so refreshing because it was such yeah. like a pressure thing in teen in teen days, oh in the gosh. high school days too. You got to have a girlfriend or a boyfriend mm-hmm. and you got to be holding hands in the hallway and, and you got to have someone to go to homecoming with. And just the depression yeah. around Valentine's Day if you didn't have someone, which is lame because you're like 14, mm-hmm. you don't know, right? somebody. I think the best part is that this is actually falling on Valentine's Day this year. So, and it's on a Friday, which is cool. So doubly taking the pressure off needing to have plans or something. That's it, great. It's also fun when it falls on Friday the 13th, but that alas is not this year. <laughs> That's great. Something unanticipated about becoming a librarian and especially youth services is that you really become a community figure. So Ferndale is obviously a cool place to hang out. So I do spend some time here outside of my working hours. There's a cafe down the street and probably one or two summers ago, I was getting a coffee before I came to work on the weekend and I almost tripped over a little guy on his on his tricycle inside the coffee shop. Um, and I looked down and I was like, oh, sorry, bud. And I looked and I was like, oh, hey, knew him from story time. Mm-hmm. And he was there with his two siblings and his father. And so that was really cool. He goes, hey, it's the librarian mm-hmm. to his dad. Mm-hmm. And so being able to go outside and, you know, also show kids that we're real human beings outside of this building because I think that's another thing is kids are always surprised to see us outside of the youth area. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. And I also wanted to say along with making these relationships with families, we celebrate with the families and we, you know, we feel for people when they're going through hardship in their lives and it definitely straddles like a public personal sort of thing. Like obviously in in a healthy and boundary filled way but you know we're not just we're not just customer service agents we're really cultivating and working with kids and we really we care about the people that we work with yeah and I think that's really important yeah yeah but like we said you know you you're engaging these kids on this somewhat like for lack of any other word this intimate level Mm mm-hmm and you know you start getting involved with their lives and they go through second grade third grade fourth grade they grow up and you get really close with their parents it's it's such an interesting role i wish there was a great way to to say the reality of it too is sometimes kids pee on the carpet and that you is the to, reality and you have to clean up pee yeah it yeah. happens yeah they should tell you that on day one you're gonna have to <laughs> clean up some pee you yeah. librarian you, you're gonna have to clean up some pee yeah you know um and i think which might be the title of this episode. <laughs> so You might have to clean up You some might pee. have to clean up some for you. I'm into it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I just, I feel like library school is one thing, but you learn so much on the ground. And when I started here originally in 2016 as a part-time librarian, I learned so much from my two colleagues at the time. Just grew leaps and bounds in, you know, six months, just like a baby. Mm-hmm. Uh, before we let you go, we have to talk about the stack of books oh, on God. your shelf, which I'm not implying the stack of books that you've done for collection development to add to the circulating collection. You're reading 278 books at one time. Is that true? It's more like 12. <laughs> um, but that's really intense and it's just wow. I wow. just want to learn and soak in all of the information 
and there's literally not enough time or space in the day to mm-hmm. do it all. But my reading goal, I'm on Goodreads, so if you feel comfortable, add me. Mm-hmm. My reading goal has grown every year. <laughs> um, <laughs> so for 2019, it was 150 books, and I did surpass it. And to be fair, I am reading books for all ages, so they're, I don't count picture books, but juvenile fiction young adult adult books and audiobooks yeah that's and, right because you're reading what you would be also adding to the collection yeah, so yourself I, I think it's super important to be familiar with what's in my collection and i think that's what makes me good at readers advisory is that i've actually read the books and you know can recommend it more in detail and also say i loved it because yeah but my reading goal for 2020 is 160 and it's happening you read 160 in like November. That's how many books I saw on hold in your <laughs> in your desk. You know, uh, we also didn't get into the Caldecott and the Newberry Awards are coming up, and I mean, I there's there's value to awarding books, and I think that it's become a little bit better in terms of rewarding and honoring more diverse books. But I think you know, and this is something that we covered in library school, and something to consider is who was on those committees. Ah, so. You know, is it is it an all white committee? Right. Are they represented with people of color, LGBTQ people? Who's choosing these books? Mm-hmm. Right. It. I was even just having a comparable argument just even about Academy Awards, which is different, but it's so subjective. Mm-hmm. It's almost more beneficial to me to pay attention to who's winning more specific awards. So, like the Coretta Scott King Award, the Pura Belpri Award. I hope I'm not mispronouncing that, but. You know, so that's excellence in black fiction and then Latinx. And I feel like that's very important. That's a good point, though, because when I say Caldecott and Newberry, those are like old, long-standing, institutional almost Mm -hmm. uh, things that I grew up with in the 80s and 90s. And Mm -hmm. they were like the standard bearer. But there's so many new awards that we can't pay attention to, which are broadening that field and sort of talking about more diversity and even just books that are even more daring. Mm-hmm. Totally. So, uh, did we leave out any other favorite memories so far? I know you've only been here two years, but you can go back to your Kalamazoo days too. I think you know. I'm just happy to happy to be here. Happy to do what I do. You know, you do a magic trick because I am one of those people who says sort of this scapegoat line of I don't know how to talk to kids, and you know, it it requires some sort of magic sort of genuineness that I don't think that most adults can. The, the, my favorite thing about becoming an adult was like, oh, I can just talk to adults like other adults. We all just know adult language. We can all just say the cliched stuff. And then, it, and then like a 14 year old would come up to the circulation desk and I'd be like as shy and awkward as they are. I came up, I did an internship in college with 826 Michigan and then I continued volunteering for them um, for a year after I graduated. And I remember one of the program coordinators saying, Whenever she went into the middle school, she would always double check what she was wearing <laughs> and just like look at herself and be like, oh, uh, and realizing that she was, a, yeah, becoming as awkward as a pubescent. It's so teen. weird how that happens. You just got to push through it. Uh, you got to push through. I'll try. We're all, we're all awkward. We never grow out of our awkwardness. We just learn to express it in different ways. So yeah run with that yeah but then i also want to come off as seeming cool to them and look like i'm with it and hip and i get it and snapchat and all that i think you just got to be yourself yeah Mm -hmm. yeah and i think self-deprecation goes a little ways as well because acknowledging that you aren't perfect but in a kind of a funny way that works too yeah just be yourself kids yeah all right this has been another episode of a little too quiet and we got perspective of a youth librarian here thanks for being here Elissa. thanks for having me uh it is february of 2020 we're continuing the year-long celebration of this library's 90th anniversary and thank you so much for checking this podcast out hoping you can tell your other library loving friends about it and if you're out there on the apple podcasts please leave us a review we were able to bring this podcast into a reality thanks to the friends of the ferndale library you can support this podcast by going to the Friends of the Ferndale Library online where you can join or donate. It's ferndalefriends.org. My name's Jeff Milo. Kelly Bennett has been here with her awesome blue cardigan and Elissa Zimmer, our youth services librarian. More episodes to come. 
We hope you enjoyed this one. Thanks for listening.